Hello, everybody. Good, good afternoon, and thanks for coming out to hear me. Now, if you know anything about me, you know that I work on fundamental physics. I work on quantum physics, quantum gravity, cosmology, the nature of space and time, the history of the universe, and so forth. And increasingly, if you've been following, but it's easy to say what I'm interested in. I'm interested in time, and whether time is fundamental, real, or whether it's something like, something that, that is emergent, that is not part of the real fabric of the universe. And I have to say that I believe that time is fundamental, and believing so puts me in the minority. And very good friends like Carlo Rivelli, Sean, and, and Einstein, to throw him in, um, have asserted very vehemently that time is not fundamental that there exists a level of reality below time. And if you believe that now, I hope I'll disabuse you of that. Okay, so the talk I'm giving is based on very new work, which I have a new collaborator, Claudio Verde, but I have to thank also my longtime collaborators in wondering about the nature of time, Julian Barber, who got me started down this road, Marina Cortez, the Brazilian philosopher Roberto Manguebera Unger, and then many other people who I've worked with. So uh, um, I call myself a relationalist, and that means that I believe that time and space are not, are not absolute, are not fixed for all time. There is not a notion of where something is or when something happened. There's absolute, all those kinds of spatial temporal ideas have to do with relationships. And indeed, all properties of things in the world have to do with relationships. Relationships between dynamical actors, what we physicists call degrees of freedom. And we go back in our thinking, there's a, quite a tradition, we go back to the philosopher Leibniz, who proposed the great principle of the identity of the indiscernible. The idea is that if two events or two particles have the same properties relationally, have the same set of relations with the rest of the world. They are the same. There are not ever in the world two events or two things that appear to be the same, but are not. And that's the key principle, and we'll see how that leads us to our views of space and time. Now, the view that I'm going to develop is a kind of elaboration of what I think was Linus's original view. Not that that matters, it should matter. But the universe, according to Leibniz, according to me, is nothing but the set of partial views of itself. That is, you have a view of the world from where you sit, when you sit there, or stand, or walk. I have a view of the world, the Martians have a view of the world. And I'm anthropomorphizing it, but I don't need intelligent beings or anything else. Every event in the history of the universe has a view that is past the events that led up to it. And the universe is nothing but the collection of these views. And we'll see how that idea elaborates. So I don't follow Everett and my old mentor, Bryce DeWitt and John Wheeler, great scientists as they were, in saying that we have one wave function which describes many universes. I can't make sense of that idea. What I'm going to tell you is that there are many partial views to describe a single universe. And we don't have in science many universes. We have one universe. And that universe is what it is. It has the properties it has. It has the peculiarities it has. It might have been different. It might have been a different universe. But there is only one universe, and that's what we scientists and philosophers want to explain. Not the generality universe is, but just the one universe in which we find ourselves. So I've been thinking about these things for a long time, and it's good to get shaken up. It's good to have a new point of view. And the following is a new point of view. And this is the first time these ideas are exposed. They were developed with Celia Coverde and we'll see how they go over. I think the ideas are radical, but they're not difficult to understand and appreciate, and I hope you will. So let's start by saying something we all know, 
quantum mechanics asserts that many questions about nature have indefinite answers. If we ask, if we have a radioactive nuclei in a box here, and we know that the half-life is two days, that's what quantum mechanics tells us, a statistical prediction. But when within the two days or within the next weeks or months will that particular radioactive nuclei decay? It's indefinite. Quantum mechanics doesn't tell us, just tells us probabilities. When it does decay, it makes a neutrino. What direction will the neutrino go off? Well, the quantum mechanics gives us probabilities for different directions. It doesn't tell us it's indefinite. When we look, if we look for an electron in the atom of that nuclei, where will we find it? Quantum mechanics gives us the wave function, this beautiful kind of contrast picture, which gives us the probabilities to find the electron in different places, but it only gives us the probabilities. It's indefinite. And the electron has a spin, and will that spin be up or down if we measure it? Again, quantum mechanics just gives us probabilities. So many things in nature, according to quantum mechanics, are indefinite. And notice something, these are all questions about the future. Well, let's keep going. Other questions are definite. What time did the nuclei decay? It decayed sometime yesterday, let's say. What time was it when it decayed? Well, there is a definite answer. It decayed at 7.26 a.m. When it decayed, which direction did the neutrino run off in? Well, there's an answer, it ran off north, northwest. When we looked, where did we find the electron in the hydrogen atom? Two or three angstroms due north from the nuclei, etc. What was the spin when we measured it last Tuesday? Was it up or down? It gives us a definite answer. To notice something about these questions, and if I could see you and we could do an interaction, I would ask you to shout out the answer. But maybe, maybe I'll hear if people shout really loud. These are all questions about the past. Now, is this important? We've been learned, we've been told by numerous physicists and philosophers that there's no difference between the past and the future or the present. They're just points of view, they're just where we are, just like, it doesn't matter fundamentally whether I'm in Toronto or New York or London or Paris or Istanbul or Tokyo. It's not supposed to matter whether it's Thursday or next Tuesday to what physics, what the laws of nature are, to what the physical theories are. But I'm saying here, I'm noticing that when we use quantum mechanics as experimentalists, we use it for real. When we're talking about things that are indefinite, we're talking about the future. When we're talking about things that are in-depth, that are definite, we're talking about the past. Whose future and whose past? Mine and yours, in the moment. So this calls to mind the philosophy of time. And it's not too popular among scientists, but it's very well discussed among philosophers called presentism. Now, this is not exactly presentism. If you know what that is, and you'll see that as we move forward. And even look at my metaphor, move forward. But we're going to try to take seriously what it means to build a science around a world in which, in fact, it means something whether you're the future or the past. Well, the first thing you might say is, well, if everything is definite uh, eventually, then what about the uncertainty principle? It doesn't matter, everything can be definite in the past and it doesn't affect the uncertainty principle. In fact, Werner Heisenberg, who invented the uncertainty principle, thought about this and said, this formulation makes it clear that the uncertainty relation does not refer to the past. So if there's something wrong with talking about the past and future, Werner Heisenberg was at fault as well, not just myself and Clevia and a few other people. So what do we mean when we're talking about the future and the past? Well, Ernest Schrodinger also recognized the distinction between the present, the future, and the past. And this is just a small part of a quote the larger quote, I have to confess, I find hard to parse. You go looking for it, he seems to be wanting to dissolve in an orgy of erotic whatever with the universe. Schrodinger was kind of a strange guy, but here he's endorsing this view, which is called presentism, that for eternally and always there is only now, 
one and the same now. The present is the only thing that has no end. And then a longer quote, let's look for somebody sensible, not such a romantic. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.